I was scrolling through Facebook today trying to recover. I saw an article posted by, I think, a church down in Texas that was on greeting one another with a holy kiss. I said, nope, that's out. <laughs> we are not trying that today or any time over the last 48 hours. I was telling someone earlier, it has been by far the most interesting gospel meeting uh, of them all. But I hope tonight your time uh, here will be rewarded as we were able to look at God's Word together. In Haggai chapter 3, we're going to continue, or rather Haggai chapter 1, we're going to continue our discussion of what I'm calling the white pages this week. And that, in short, are lessons from Scripture from the not-so-worn pages of Scripture. When we're told by Paul that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that includes the sections of our Bible that don't get the wear and the use and the airtime that, say, in Acts 2, Matthew 5, other passages tend to get. Um, and the minor prophets certainly fall within that category. Haggai, it really, did, to understand the story of, uh, of Haggai, we need to back up a bit into Ezra. So in Ezra chapter 3, we're told the story of the foundation of the second temple being laid. Of course, you remember the first temple built by Solomon was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar uh, on one of his three visits to Jerusalem. As he raised the rest of the city to the ground, that temple fell. In Ezra 3, we're told the story of the second temple's foundation being laid. And this happened about two years after the Jews arrived back home from Babylonian captivity. Somewhere in and around the year 538 B.C., 538, 539, depending on, on kind of what date you prefer. It was a time of rejoicing, but the foundation is as far as the Israelites would get. When you read Ezra chapter 4, there were some Samaritans. Now, you remember the Samaritans, the in essence, half-breeds between the native, uh, or rather the, the Jewish Israelites and the Gentile pagan nations around them. The Samaritans or the northern Israelites had intermarried with them and not only became mixed uh, sort of racially or, or by bloodline, but they also mixed their religions. They've taken some of the elements of Israelite worship of Yahweh and they've blended them with pagan worship and kind of created their own little mixture. In Ezra 4, the Samaritans arrive and they seem to want to do a noble thing. They want to help the construction of this new temple. But because they had blended paganism into their Judaism, they're basically rejected by Ezra and company. They are told that they cannot help with the construction of the temple. They get angry about this. And what everyone does when they get angry is send off an angry letter, correct? They shoot an angry letter to Artaxerxes, the king of Persia at the time. And they convince him to draft a formal decree that all work... Notice the phrase I just used. All work in Jerusalem was supposed to stop. In Ezra chapter 5, Haggai and Zechariah, the same Haggai and Zechariah from our minor prophets, arrive in Jerusalem and they tell the people it's time to start building again. And so they begin building. And this happens in the year about 516. Sounds like a simple story. They began building the temple, ran into some difficulties, as all building projects do. They take a little bit of a time out. You might say it's a little much for a little bit, but you know. And then these two men from God show up and they tell them, hey, you need to start building the temple again. And they start and then all is finished. It's those two dates I want you to look at a little more closely. Even if they're both off by a year or two. That's a rather long break in the action, is it not? From 538 to 516. Somewhere, give or take, in the range of 20 years. Now that's more than enough time for an angry letter to make it back to Xerxes. Or to Xerxes. In fact, that's, that's almost an excessively large amount of time. This brings to mind a few questions, I think. For one, what'd they do for 20 years? Did they sit on their hands? Did they farm? What went on in Jerusalem for that 20-year period when after they had started building the foundation to the temple of their God, that they just randomly stopped? 
Were things so bad and so oppressed that they simply could not do the work for 20 years? You know, the Samaritans and the others just had their thumb on top of them. The Persians just would not let them build. Is that really what happened? And then when you ask that question, it makes you want to ask another question. Why is this the only time in Israelite history when it's okay for God's people to not carry out the thing God told them to do? Like in the time period that he told them to do it. Every other time they're told to do something, it's a matter of now. This needs to happen now. But for some reason, at this stage, we get a 20-year hiatus. My son, Ty, read just a moment ago from Psalm 132, verses 4 and 5. Now listen to the contrast in these two verses and whatever's happening in the Israelite camp or the Israelite city of Jerusalem. Psalm 132, verses 4 and 5, it says, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the Mighty One of Jacob. The attitude of Israel in Ezra 3, 4, and 5, and specifically tonight in Haggai chapter 1, is very different from the spirit David exhibited in his wanting to build the temple and even in Solomon's actually carrying out of that instruction. This makes you ask one final question. Where are their priorities? Where do the Israelite priorities lie? In short, the story of what happened with Israel is the story of what happens with us a lot of times. We start out with decent foundations. We start out building on the right place. Maybe we start our walk as becoming Christians. We're baptized. We're zealous. I remember, okay, so I, I, would, I remember when I was baptized, and I, I, was, I was fairly young. But I remember the next couple of days when I was at school, I like ran down the hallway for something. And then I thought, oh, great, right? Because I had done something wrong. A lot of us start with these different foundations. We start with these, these priorities. We've got our priorities in the right spot. And then over time, we look up, and it's been 20 years since we've done anything or 20 days, or 20 weeks. What happens to us when our priorities get out of whack? And what will it take to get them back in whack? That's what I want to think with you about this evening briefly. Hopefully, if you have your Bible, you've found Haggai chapter 1 by this point. If you haven't, find the book of Matthew and back up three books. Okay, and That'll get you into the correct zone of the Scripture. I want to read it with you first. The first, uh, At least the first four verses. I got chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? And we'll read the rest of the section in just a second, but I want you to notice some things just from the first four verses of Haggai's kind of opening message to them. It should trouble us that a message from God to God's people doesn't say my people. That's the first thing I want you to notice in the text. Notice there with the in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says. Typically when God describes his people, he says my people. There's this refrain that runs through the Old Testament. I will be their God and they shall be not those people, but my people. Right? God describes Israel as the people whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. When Pharaoh was given a message from God during the, during the ten plagues, you remember Moses was sending the message. What was the message? Let whose people go? Let my people go, right? That's the way God typically addresses Israel. Except when Israel's in trouble. When Israel crosses the line, when Israel has a serious problem... God switches from my people to those people. A great example of this is in Exodus 32. You remember the chapter where Israel builds the golden calf? That's stepping over the line you know, by, by a lot, right? 
When they build the golden calf and they begin worshiping it, listen to this. Exodus 32 and verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people, whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Do you hear the difference? Not my people, your people. When Israel's in serious trouble, God switches to this other way of referring to them. Those people. It's the same type of statement Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. In that passage, he's quoting from Isaiah 29 and verse 13. This is going to sound familiar. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Right? Not my people honors me with their lips, but this people. So in Haggai 1, when it says this people says the time has not yet come, already we have a big negative red mark on whatever's coming next. And that gives us a sense of how to interpret what we read. Now notice what the people said specifically. This people says, the time has not yet come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Do your kids ever make this kind of excuse? When you ask them why a certain thing has happened and they respond with, well, I just didn't have the time. I covered up, had all I could do. We're like, you had three days, you know? Or if it's something, you know, shorter, you had half an hour. Israel had 20 years. This people say, it's not, it's not quite time yet enough. What, what exactly were they waiting on? Maybe a better season? Maybe for it to warm up? It warmed up 20 times. Too hot? It cooled off 20 times. And yet they address God and they say, it's not quite time to do the thing God gave us to do. lest we put ourselves on too high of a pedestal and look down at the Israelites, this is the same sort of thing we do. We look at God's commands, and while we do not maybe reject them outright, we often make the same type of excuse that it's just not yet time to do what God has given us to do. And you can fill in much, most any command or most anything you want in that category. We know better than to say no directly. So we say it indirectly by saying it's not quite time enough. How many of us have allowed 5, 10, 20, 30 years to go by before we've set about finishing the work God's given us to do? There's one other thing in these, in these verses that, that I want you to see. Verses 3 and 4 is a stunning indictment. You see, what was always the thing when my kids, whenever they fail to do the thing I've asked them to do, it's usually because they were busy doing something else, right? It's never, they never just, you know, sat in their room for 20 minutes on their hands. They've been doing something else. In verses 3 and 4, notice what Israel has been doing in the time period, in, in this 20-year time frame. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Question, how'd they get the paneled houses? Israel was raised to the ground. Babylon left it like a plowed field. How'd they get all these paneled houses? Not just houses, but houses with wood plank paneling inside and maybe on the outside. How'd they get those? In one sentence, the Jews are shown the foolishness of all their excuses. Because the very houses they dwell in stand as a proof of what they could have been doing with those 20 years, or at least inside of those 20 years. Here's another troubling passage. When, the, when Artaxerxes issues his edict that the city is not to be rebuilt, that's exactly what he said. The city must not be rebuilt, or may not be rebuilt in this version. Israel did a little, of a, a little what do you say, creative interpretation of the law here. Well, he said we couldn't rebuild the city. That, that just really kind of means the temple. But we can work on our own house. It'll be okay. The actions of the Jews in those 20 years demonstrated that they had the ability to carry out God's commands, but not the will or the desire to do so. They had 20 years and plenty of resources. What they lacked was the actual will to carry out what God said to do. 
give you a counterexample. In 1 Kings chapter 6, the last verse of 1 Kings chapter 6, it's described there how long it took Solomon to finish the original temple. The original temple that was, you know, many times of a greater magnitude and glory and, and of, of greater, what's the word I'm looking for? More riches, right? More opulent than the temple they're building now. It took Solomon seven years to finish that. And then when he said about building his own house, it took him 13 years. Now, some have read this passage and said, well, clearly Solomon's a materialistic guy. He only spent seven on the temple while he spent 13 years on his own house. I don't care how, how opulent his house is. Notice what order Solomon put them in. Even though it would take his own house longer to build than the temple, he built the temple first. And he finished it inside the seven years. And then set about building his own house. The Israelites in Ezra and in Haggai 1 have it completely backwards. They've been working on their own paneled houses while the house of the Lord lay in ruins. It frightens me to consider sometimes how much we're able to accomplish in every other area of life compared to that within the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God of which we are supposed to be thinking of that first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, you remember, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I can spend two or three hours a night, three or four nights a week at a ball field for a youth football or a baseball game and then struggle to find an hour once a month for a Bible study. I can talk to people on hour for hours about my personal interests and what happened on social media, but when it comes time to talk about the kingdom, suddenly I can't find time, opportunity, or motivation. Why? It's not because I lost my tongue. I lost the motivation to move it for the kingdom. See, our excuses are just that, ladies and gentlemen. They're excuses. And they don't hold up under scrutiny. The same way Israel's excuses didn't hold up under the words of Haggai, delivered from God himself. In Haggai 1, we get the therefore also. We get the address, we get the indictment, verses 3 and 4, and then we get the therefore. The therefore, or here's, based on that, Here's what I have to say to you. We sort of address the problem. Now we begin to address how do we fix it. Haggai chapter 1, continue with me in verse 5. The Bible says, Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it, or but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on and on all the labor of your hands. You might have noticed you heard twice in that section God telling them, consider your ways, consider be mindful of the path you've chosen. He says to Israel, take a step back and look at what you've pursued. Look at what you had the motivation to go for rather than going for the things of God. What did those things earn you? You might have noticed too that you heard two sections that were kind of the same sort of thought, right? In verses 5 and 6, you've sown much but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough. You drink, there's not enough for that. You put on clothing, it's not warm enough. When you earn money, it's like you're putting it into a bag with holes in it, and it's just falling out the other side. The same point is made in 9, 10, and 11. You've went after all these other things except what was most important. And because of it, God struck that and took it away from you. What we pursue besides God ends up, winds up running away from us. 
And it's not because it just magically grew legs. That's what God does to it. God has this habit, and it's a good one, of recognizing when His people are running after their idols and He begins tugging the idols away from them to remind them that wasn't what they were supposed to be chasing in the first place. In 9-11, through 11, the consequences of seeking those things is simple. God takes them away. Notice there's also a bit of poetic justice in this section. In verse 9, because of my house which lies desolate. Because the house of God re- remained desolate. Because it wasn't taken care of. Everything else in Israel's life was similarly not taken care of. As they left the temple desolate, so they would be left desolate. God making the point clearly, if you set your heart and your priorities on earthly things, they will betray you. If that sounds familiar, it should. Jesus preached the same message in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 where he tells the Jews there, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. It's the same struggle we have today. Our eyes become attracted to the things of the world around us. And we begin seeking and searching after those things rather than God. And God has this way of pulling the rug out from under us to remind us that's not what you were supposed to be pursuing in the first place. But I want you to notice how this particular section is set up. The structure of it is is interesting too. In verses 5 and 6, here are the things you've went after and they always seem to be running out. In verses 9 through 11, these things you're going after are being taken away from you. But in the middle, in verses 7 and 8, kind of the the cream filling in the middle of the two Oreo cookies is this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, remember your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. In between two sections that emphasize the deceitfulness of what Israel had sought after is the section highlighting what should have been their focus all along. Build the temple. Do the work God has given you to do. Carry out what you were brought there to do. Instead of being set on earthly things, set your heart and your mind and your back to the work that's truly going to profit you. The purpose for building this house is the same purpose for everything that God followers are told to do during our lives, and it is for the purpose of glorifying God. It is not because God needed a temple. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. The temple is for human benefit, not for God benefit. But the fact that there would be a present temple would be a benefit to them. Everything that God follower is supposed to do is to be for the glory of God. It stands to reason. We are created in Genesis 2 in the image of God. Literally as representations or as you know, versions of God, not gods ourselves. But we're created to identify and to glorify who is the creator of this world. And when we set that as our purpose, so many other passages in scriptures tend to fall into place. Just as Israel was told here, go rebuild the temple that I may be glorified. Everything about our lives as Christians is to be for this point. Which is the reason why Jesus taught the way He did in Matthew 5. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and notice how good of a person you are. No. So that they can see your good works and glorify your Father. When we identify that this is the central purpose of our lives, even suffering, accepting one another, as Romans 15 describes. We accept one another just as we were accepted by Christ. For what purpose? For the glory of God. Even the arrival of Jesus to accept sinful mankind 
was not for the purpose of glorifying himself, but for the purpose of glorifying God. It's the reason why Paul would describe in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, it's to be to the glory of God. Do we see now why their failure to rebuild the temple was a deeper problem than just a delayed construction project? It was to be for the purpose of glorifying their father. They had failed to finish that work. And as a result, all the other aspects of their life were being stripped away from them to make the point to them that you have one purpose and you need to be set about on that purpose. It causes us to question whether or not we have forgotten our purpose. And we can ask this a number of different ways. When my relationship with my family comes before my relationship with God, we are in sore need of a priority check. The God that gave us our family has a higher precedent than the family. When my commitment to my recreation or to my hobbies or to my, even to my career, if that overshadows my commitment to my brethren, to the kingdom, if there's always a reason to miss services but never a reason to miss work, it would cause me to question where my priorities were if I were in that situation. And I've been there before. When my allegiance to my country overshadows my allegiance to my God, when I think more about who's going to be the next Speaker of the House, of course, that question's been settled, but you know, not too long ago, we were all tied up in who's going to be the next Speaker of the House. Name the last five. Right? Right? We burden ourselves with these things that at the end of the day do not matter. When I let my comfort and my excuses stand in the place where my glorifying God should be, I need to check my priorities. Now, as we've read Haggai 1, can can you imagine this might not have been a super popular message in Israel in this time period? Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Fewer people like to be told kind of officially from God, hey, you've been, you've been you know, lollygagging here. You've not been carrying out what you've been supposed to have been doing. I, can, I, mean, I don't doubt that this probably didn't go over super well, but I want you to notice what actually did happen. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 12. Zerubbabel is the leader of this, this bunch. So as leaders have to do, leaders, you know, it's like when I was coaching. When, when you win, the kids did a good job, and when you lose, the coach did a terrible job. That's just kind of the way it works. But in, Zech- or in Ze- Zechariah, Haggai 1.12, Zerubbabel, notice what he does. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the works of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. However it was they took the message, they did the right thing with it. The leader Zerubbabel, the high priest Shealtiel, or I'm sorry, uh, Jehozadak, Joshua, one of those guys, and all the rest of the Israelites did the work. Now, there's a lot that would have to go on in there. There's this recognition that we've done something wrong. There's the need to, to hear and believe and obey the message. It's a, a, something we say often ourselves. But at the end of the day, in, Zech- in Haggai 1.12, they did the thing. They probably didn't like hearing that they you know, had been slacking off this whole time. And they probably thought, since they were in paneled houses, that they were doing pretty well for themselves. I mean, honestly, normally blessings imply that God's happy with you, and so they're in a paneled house. We must be doing okay. And then these two dudes show up and say, no, you're not. They might have been upset with Haggai and Zechariah. But they got their priorities in gear. They got their ducks in a row. And they got the work finished. And in this passage, you see two essential elements of godly priorities. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the last line of verse 12 in this version says, the people showed reverence 
for the Lord. It might say that they showed fear for the Lord, and it would be very much the same idea. Obedience and fear. And it was in so doing that they came back to the original plan of God. If obey is the most unpopular biblical word in the religious world today, fear might be close second. There's this thought that, well, we should never fear God. Yes, we should. Not because He's malicious, but because He's God. It's like saying, I want you to stand next to the train track outside while the train's running by. I want you to stand four foot from the line. Are you afraid of it? Yes. Is the train out to get you? No. Why do, you, why do you fear it? Because it's immensely powerful beyond all of your comprehension or ability to stop it. Fear is the appropriate response to God. Fear was the response to God that God recommended. If anybody's to say, how should mankind respond to the Creator? It would be the Creator. In Deuteronomy 13.4, The Bible says, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him. You shall keep His commandments, listen to His voice, serve Him, and cling to Him. That's the one, well, that's one of many key differences between our Lord and the freight train. We are allowed to cling to God. He permits us to have relationship with Him, to draw near to Him. He draws near to us. This is the plan God has for us, not just obedience, not just compliance, Not just checking off the box, but a reverent fear leading to a dependence on God, a clinging to God, a trust in God. Maybe if we do that, we'll rebuild our temple before we set about building our house. Maybe if we trust that God really will add all these things to us the way Jesus promised. Maybe if we trust Him enough will set about doing His work and putting His kingdom first. What I love about this passage in Haggai 1 is we not only get the sort of the problem, we get the, you know, here's the solution to your problem. We get verse 12 where the problem's being solved. We also get God's response. In 1 and verse 13, the Bible says, Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. Such a short, sort of positive statement there. But it is a beautiful one. God sent Haggai back to the Israelites. He says, this is what I want you to tell them. I am with you. What more would you want God to say to you? Wouldn't that be enough, really, at the end of the day? If we could lay our head down at night, and close our eyes, and the last thought that runs through our mind before the dreams take over is, God's with me. It's really going to be okay. That's a beautiful thought. What greater blessing could you have than that? And yet, to get to this point, we have to go through verse 12. Before we get to the point where God sends His messenger back to the people saying, I'm with you, His people have to respond in reverent, fearful obedience. There's no God being with you unless we go through verse 12 and we act to obey whatever His will is for us. Maybe you're ready to take a fresh look at your priorities after all this. I know I am. I've said it before, but most sermons are written with the mirror on the desk. That way you know who you're preaching to. More than once this has gotten my attention, that my priorities are not where they need to be. Are you concerned that maybe you've been living a a rather busy yet fruitless life for God for years? You're not the first ones. We just read of a bunch. 20 years, no temple. Their houses may have been spectacular, but their service before God was lacking. If you're willing to put God first, if you're willing to take a chance, put the kingdom first, then something really special awaits. Now, the special thing that awaits us is a little different from the special thing that awaited Israel. But at the end of the book of Haggai, there's a beautiful passage. In Haggai 2 and verse 20, the last kind of section of the book, kind of the last message of Haggai, to Zerubbabel and the rest is this. 
It says, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders. The horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. God says, I will make Zerubbabel my signet ring. The signet ring being the, the symbol on the ring of the ruler's hand. It would be a, a symbol of the divine power and the authority of the ruler. Someone who wore the signet ring would have the power and the authority of the king himself. And God says, I'm going to put that on you, Zerubbabel. So somehow, Zerubbabel is going to wind up with the power and the authority of God? It's not something that would come true in Zerubbabel's life. But it would become true in Zerubbabel's family. Because Zerubbabel is a direct ancestor of Jesus. The son of Shealtiel has a son who has a son who has a son who has a son. And on down the list goes until you arrive at Joseph. Joseph, by whom Jesus was born, the husband of Mary, of course not his direct blood descendant, we understand why. But to a man who decided he would listen to the message, difficult as it was, he would put God's priorities first and he would set about finishing the work God gave him to do. God gave him a special place in the history of his people, in the story of the gospel. Matthew chapter 1, recording forever the name of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. It is through this Jesus that God has shown all of us his deep love and his affection. Just as a signet ring would only be given to one whom you love and trust, God has entrusted to all of us Jesus. Jesus is our sign that we as Christians are inseparable from God and from the love of Christ, the way Romans 8 describes. Through Jesus, God will take care of us like one of His valuable possessions, like even a ring of gold that bears His seal. Do you enjoy this sort of relationship with God tonight? If not, I think the message of Haggai 1 bears repeating. If they could stand to hear it twice, maybe we could stand to hear it a third time. Consider your ways. Think about it. What are you pursuing? What's got your mind and your heart and your life and your wallet tied up in all these other pursuits rather than that of the kingdom? Maybe if we'd be willing to take a chance, and by maybe I mean definitely, if we'd be willing to allow God to do His work and His providing, and we set about building our temple, working in the kingdom, then Jesus will provide what we need. And it can be said of us that God is with us. Zerubbabel and Judah didn't have it right, but they got it right when they got the message. And the question is whether we will make that same sort of change. You can follow suit with the people of Haggai tonight. And I don't mean wait for 20 years. Let's not do that. However long it's been, let's listen to the message of God, the message that says, start my work now. Maybe it's to obey the gospel. Maybe you've never made that step to become one of God's people. You need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and start that process of living with God. Maybe you've started that process. Maybe you're one of God's people and you've taken 20 weeks, months, years to get started. If God was unwilling to set, if God was unwilling to work with people who'd made mistakes, why did he write the letter of Haggai? He gave him another chance. And he's giving you your chance as well. If you have a need this evening, whether to obey the gospel or come back to it, I beg you to consider your station, consider your ways as we stand, as we sing.